no matter if I'm selling in India or if I'm selling in the United States, I'm able to go through the same steps of lead generation, demo calls, proof of concept, contract negotiations, mm -hmm. but I will use different arguments and different language where when I will be explaining different points during along the process. I started my sales career in a, you know, in a few different companies as a business development manager and grew up to the business director, business development director. And then back in 2013, I uh, started my own company with co-founder. And this is where the whole philosophy of leadership completely changed because, you know, part of the big organization, you're responsible for a small function, while as a kind of a founder, you need to do almost everything yourself. And uh, after, you know, seven, six years uh, of being a CEO and co-founder, I sold my company to Piana. And again, I had to switch back to this mode where I need to understand what are those areas of influence I need to build connections to and how I make sure that I'm not trying to influence everyone instead relying on strengths of other people. So in this context, I would say that if we're speaking about, you know, my current philosophy and leadership is based uh, on the understanding of your weak points mm -hmm. and uh, understanding strength points of yourself and your team and really trust and rely on others' ability to make decisions. And as much as possible, especially, you know, for salespeople who are, uh, as myself, I'm trying to be very much in control. Um, it is very important actually to, to create a sense that people in your team are in control and they are able to make decisions on their own. So that's what driving my leadership at the moment. Brilliant. That's a really great answer. So you kind of went from owning your own company, wearing a billion and one hats to letting a, a lot of other people wear those hats as well. So that makes a lot of sense. Exactly. <laughs> okay, so let's move on to scaling. A lot of people, a lot of owners, a lot of leaders, they do talk about scaling. My question to you is, how do you know when something's predictable and it's ready to scale? Um, yeah, it's a really good question. And I think um, it depends on what is the phase the business and the product is. Uh, because if we're talking about startup, right, there is a lot of books and uh, conversations around product market fit. And uh, I, I think that is generally defines the moment where you are ready to scale and invest money in replicating what you already have. Uh, but in the real world, it's really hard to find and see where is this moment, like where you can say definitely that you're ready to put money into scaling what you have and instead of keep exploring if it actually works and there is enough addressable market. Uh, in general, I think what is one of the key factors that you as a salesperson or as a business development person uh, should look at is whether the approach you use for previous clients work as well for the next client. And if you have you know, multiple use cases in a row where you see that same pitch, same presentation, uh, same objections handling strategies work, it looked like that you find you found the system that can be replicated. The main second question in this process is if you understand uh, what is your addressable market and if there is enough companies like this where you can apply the same methodology. Because you know, if you're a super high-level enterprise market and you have only five companies that you know, uh, can inherit the approach that you use, it doesn't make sense to scale it, right? You need to repeat what you did uh, on the same scale. But if there are hundreds of thousands of companies like that, and you see that with the first three or five, the same process work, you should definitely start putting more money into bringing more people who will uh, scale this process. Brilliant. Okay. So there's a lot of factors you need to think about. So, okay. When you talk about if something has scaled, if that has scaled successfully, how do you know whether this process is ready to be repeated? And in what regions, how do you go about doing that? 
Um, yeah, basically it's touching slightly the previous point, right? With regard mm -hmm. to uh, how do you understand where to scale it and, and when to repeat it. I think in general, uh, scaling means that you have a repetitive process, right? That mm -hmm. just requires more money or more people uh, to be done uh, on a you know bigger scale, right? So you, mm -hmm. you can put in the same funnel more dollars and you will get more leads on top of the funnel and as a result more revenue at the at the bottom of the funnel um the question related to you know when to repeat or not mm -hmm. depends on who you sell to if for example in my case i mostly work with SaaS businesses and there is a quite strong and i think generally universal system related to um uh, separating roles in the sales process between you have first the lead generation and qualification, uh, then you have um, discovery and demo uh, part of the process where you need people who are able to close the deal. And then you have so-called farmers or like customer success managers who are ready to pick up the uh, closed contract and start building long-term relationship. Um, so within each of these parts, if you have specific tactics that works the best for your business, like you know where you will be looking for leads, whether it's LinkedIn or whether it's events or whether it's some other marketing channel, um, if you know what are the best approach for um, you know, doing demos and how to present features that explain the value for the business right uh it, it, the same thing go for the account management if you understand who are the key stakeholders in the companies and how communication with them will influence upsell cross-sell opportunities expansion of contracts uh all of these questions depending on the stage of the process mm -hmm. uh, will lead you to decision whether it's a repetitive approach or not and if not what you need to change to make it more effective mm -hmm. okay so if you have a specific, you have to ask, answer a lot of questions, Alex. Do you have a, if you were to make a checklist or like a framework, what would be in that framework for scaling, for having a repeatable process and for, to have predictability? Are you talking about uh, the sales process or more general building company, building the product? So more general, say if you have, like in your specific situation, if I can get my words out today. Um, so you started your company and you wanted to expand into different regions. How would you go about that process really basic in a simple, simple way? Um, it's an interesting point. And in general, I think that there is there are a lot of differences between different regions, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Different cultures require a different approach. Mm -hmm. At the same time, I see a lot of similarities in the way people buy it, right? Um, so I would probably suggest to take two main factors into account. First, what is the typical way people buy uh, in certain vertical, right? So if it's a you know technology business, if it's a B2B company, if it's a... Um, you know, B2C company who is not very familiar with technology, right? So what, what, who are the people who are typically making decisions with regard to the product that you're trying to sell, mm -hmm. where they're looking for the answers to the questions and what type of sources information they rely on when they're making decisions, right? Where they're relying on other members of the team, on industry reports, on opinions of other customers on, or companies on the market, right? So that is one key structure that should dictate the way how you uh, build any repetitive, repetitive process for the company mm -hmm. uh, for, for selling uh, your product. Next one related to uh, geographics and some regional specialities. In general, I think, and for instance, you know, in, in Piana, we are selling mostly to news media businesses and uh, they have in general universal problems in different uh, parts of the world at the same time there are some uniqueness let's say you know in in developed markets media companies are mostly looking for uh, reliable revenue streams such as subscription while in emerging markets companies are more focused on uh, advertising revenue at the same time in both in both cases 
you know, on developed markets, companies are uh, also quite heavily dependent on advertising revenue and on the emerging markets, companies are looking to find more reliable revenue streams, which subscription might be one of them. That is why fundamentally, even though there are uh, unique characteristics of each region where let's say in India, you need to rely more on relationship and getting references from other players on the market. While in kind of, let's say Western markets, people are more focused on getting clear case studies, uh, results, and proof of concept. Uh, still, um, you know, you should be able to repeat your process if your product is valid for different regions without uh, changing it too much in context of the speciality or culture of the market, right? So generally speaking, no matter if I'm selling in India or if I'm selling in the United States, I'm able to go through the same steps of lead generation, demo calls, proof of concept, contract negotiations, mm -hmm. but I will use different uh, arguments and different language where when I will be explaining different points during along the process, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and these are the key two points that you need to work along. So one is the buying process. Two is the kind of cultural uniqueness that you need to take into account when you will be providing your, you know, uh, uh, explanation and, and some key points that will be used to make a decision. Uh, so I think, you know, again, it's sorry if it's a little bit too broad, right? Because I, I'm trying to make it universal. Uh, but in general, there is no silver bullet in this process. You need to, uh, you know, find the thing that is... Uh, efficient enough that you can use on in multiple regions um, mm -hmm. for your specific product. And uh, that's the only way to do it. Okay. Um, all right. So Alex, I think in this situation, if you give an exact example, so I remember before you said you spoke about building cultures or centers of excellence. So how have mm -hmm. you used this framework that you've just mentioned with those two things to do that? Yeah, so center of excellence is quite interesting thing in general, and it's more related to the operations of the company. Mm -hmm. So in our case, you know, we work, uh, Piano works on, I think, 50, more than 50 markets, uh, I mean, different countries where we have clients. And um, uh, they're combined in some super regions, such as, you know, North America or EMEA or Southeast Asia. Um, and uh, within these markets, we have kind of dedicated general managers who are trying to build these local centers of excellence. Um, and what we mean by that is that these points that I mentioned previously, where you need to understand uh, unique characteristics of the market with regard to the culture and with regard to the buying process, uh, it's quite difficult to switch the mindset of people involved in the sales process, in onboarding of the clients, in the account management, switch their mindset from doing this process on one territory and then doing the same for a very different territory. That is why it's, it works much better if uh, within one location, and I'm literally mean even one physical office where you can bind can combine people and they can work together and hear what are the arguments other people in their team are using, uh, what are the objections they're hearing, what are the issues that the clients are looking to address. If you combine people together and you give them the possibility to manage end-to-end -end process, end-to-end -end client lifecycle from initial demand generation to discovery to contract signing to development of relationship and further upsells, uh, you have a much stronger organization that uh, where we're coming back to, to my first response regarding leadership, you're giving more power to people to make decisions because they understand they are in control over everything that is happening with the product and with the client within this specific territory. And secondly, you give them the possibility to adapt and scale their approach to the whole territory that they're responsible for. Uh, so that's what I found works very well in Piana, and uh, I think it can be replicated in other businesses as well. Mm, that's really cool. So thinking more operationally, um, Alex, 
as you said, territories, they have a lot of differences. So if a country or a region, they sell better through word of mouth or through recommendations, how do you use data to continually feed this process in so that like the strategies and the tactics that each region are implementing, they're always changing and evolving and getting better? Uh, to, data and tool set in general is a very big topic and uh, you know there is no definite uh, definitive answer to that. Uh, we uh, you know at piano for instance we're using probably a good dozen dozen of different tools depending on the region and what we want to do there. Uh, just to give you an example, um, you know there is a company we partner with called Six Sense which is uh, helping to define uh, the customer intent to buy. Uh, and, uh, um, you know, it's a quite powerful solution, but it works the best mostly across United States and Western Europe, uh, just because of the data set they have. Um, at the same time, uh, you know, there are... Um, find what are the solutions used by your clients or who are the clients of your competitors, right? Mm -hmm. And that is another data set that you can use for, let's say, account-based marketing or account-based activities. So in general, we're trying to fuel multiple data streams uh, that will help us to understand our prospects' intents. So mm -hmm. where they're coming, what they're reading, what, are the, what they're thinking about. We combine it with kind of human factors. So of course, the role of the business development of, or SDR teams is also to keep constantly monitoring the prospect accounts and, you know, through LinkedIn activities, through Twitter, through other posting they're making, look, who, who are they currently hiring, what they're talking about, what's on their agenda. Um, and that is, I think, what is influencing our communication strategy, right? Mm -hmm. On top of that, of course, we also trying to set the agenda. I think it's very important for the company to position itself as a thought leader in the industry, in the vertical where it's specializing. It means generating content, talking about important topics. You might be not, you know, with Piana, it's a little bit easier for us right now because we are analyzing 2.5 billion unique users around the world monthly. So we, you know, when we're saying that we have data, people trust us. For startups, it's way more difficult because there is no proof of that their opinion actually the one that, you know, the industry should rely on. But it depends on how you position yourself. If you're confident with regard to what type of issue you're seeing and how you see the way to solve it, you can also openly talk about it in events and it also sets the tone for the conversation, right? So all of these initial factors that I mentioned, they're fueling the way how you build the conversation with your prospect. Uh, now with regard to the analysis of the sales process and efficiency of the sales in general, uh, there are of course a lot of data if you're using CRM such as Salesforce or HubSpot, have a lot of reporting and uh, it's very difficult to find the metrics that really will make a difference because you know there are dozens of different kpis that you can track but in majority of cases you know it, the, let's say the factor that you are doing 40 calls per day versus 80 calls per day will not really influence your bottom line uh, so you need to understand what actually make a difference such as number of qualified opportunities, how long the um, opportunity stays in each stage, what is the average closing cycle, what is the average uh, um, contract value, uh, how does it change we, in different territories, how does it change based on where the client came from and what is the type of company he's in. So uh, I think it takes time and for every business is different. You need to see which metrics really changing when you are growing the business or if you see the client, what are the metrics that indicate in them and use them as the base, basic you know, dashboard for you to keep constantly analyzing it. Uh, and the same goes for account management, right? You can analyze the uh, um, NPS score, you can analyze the average response time to the tickets and you have many other KPIs that you can use to understand the satisfaction level of your client mm -hmm. and any risks or so-called pull score that will allow you to understand if the client is actually you know, in a healthy relationship 
or there is a risk of losing or getting uh, uh, some down sell with them and affecting to it early enough. Mm -hmm. Well, I've spoken to a lot of ops leaders and they've, they've always had different opinions with the metrics that they focus on. And I know you said metrics, you kind of look at what's been changing and like how different metrics interact with each other. Are there any key metrics that you would focus on when it comes to deciding whether a business, a company is ready to scale, is ready to be repeated, the whole process, the whole shebang is ready to be repeated and um, it's predictable? Yeah, uh, it's a difficult question. And uh, I would say that, you know, during even the last three years, as I've been with Piana, you know, when I joined, we were a company of 150 people. Now it's a company of, you know, 600 people. And, you know, it, 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 we were at 300 plants base. Now we're over 1,000. All of these things are changing all the time. Like uh, mm -hmm. when you're scaling, your processes are not scale, scaling as well. They're typically breaking up and you need to build. Um, so in this context, I, I think that, you know, the company and the leadership should be flexible, right? Mm -hmm. And should not look at certain metrics such as, you know, when you're at a very early stage, what you're interested in is to make sure that your unit economics is working, that your lifetime value is higher than the customer acquisition cost, that uh, your churn rate within the kind of industry averages, that uh, uh, you know, net promoter score and some other things are also good. So you're not losing clients just because you cannot satisfy or, or uh, handle properly the expectations that you set during the sales process. So these are the metrics that are crucial during very early stages of the company. And I think at the point where you see that the unit economics is good for SaaS businesses, you have you know, high uh, gross margin, like over 80, 90%, that your churn rate is, let's say, below 10% on an annual basis, that your annual uh, contract value is constantly growing, mm -hmm. as well as your revenue and as well as your margin. Um, with these factors, I think you are at the, at the point where also by analyzing in parallel that you are using the same tactics to sell your product, mm -hmm. you are at the, at the moment where you can you know, start scaling. And by that, I mean, you, know, you can attract new investment rounds to bring more money and hire a bigger team. Mm -hmm. uh, you can think about you know, uh, hiring more people and so on. Um, for the company on the next stage, when it's already proved that there is a product market fit, there is a growing client base and so on, I think it's becoming very important to um, not to be satisfied with the pace of growth you have, right? Mm -hmm. Which means that you need to keep looking if you keep setting higher and higher targets and you need to re retrospectively analyze if you were able to deliver on your projections. And if not, what is broken, right? Because if you set some sales target and you're not able to achieve it quarter after quarter, it means that you do not really understand the sales process. You do not really understand the, uh, the, the, the reasons people are buying. You do not really understand who are the clients you're trying to sell to. So you need to make a step back. Mm -hmm. And But if you are able to predict your growth, if you are able to achieve or be close to your targets, then you need to start looking into the operational efficiency of your business mm -hmm. and look into uh, you know, how we can shorter the sales cycle how we can uh, upsell better, how we can onboard team faster, uh, where are the next territories where we can get a boost, what are our competitors are doing, and maybe we're missing on some of the tactics that we can apply, right? So it's becoming more observational and less strict to the KPIs. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, on the even later stages, of course, it's all coming down to gross margins and revenues and more traditional uh, financial metrics that you will be looking at as you grow in. And especially if you're also acquiring new businesses and you're combining PLs and teams, uh, then you know, financial operational efficiency probably is the key factors that will be driving your decision-making process. Okay, I love that. Okay, and final question for you, Alex. So if you were in a room full of revenue leaders, 
What's the one burning question that you would want an answer to right now? <laughs> yeah, that, that is a very interesting question. And um, I was thinking about how, you know, what might be the best uh, way to address it. In general, I think there are several key challenges that I see uh, um, across many different industries. And probably number one of them is that there are so many tools and metrics and methodologies that it's very easy to be distracted and think, oh, I found this best strategy or this strategy saying that they will bring the best results. But the reality is that, you know, all of the strategies were built or well created as methodology retrospectively. There were companies who, become, who became successful and then there were others who said, oh, we know how they did it and here is the methodology you should follow. So my number one kind of suggestion and question is how you ensure that while you're still aware with what is going on with all of the trends and what are the tactics out there that can improve your business, how you stay focused on looking at your specific business model, at your specific use case and clients and not be distracted by all of the suggestions business better based on the opinion of others. Um, I think that number one. And number two, um, my general observation is that, you know, the market is becoming more and more specialized in a way that even bigger businesses, and I'm talking about, you know, LinkedIn and Microsoft and Google, who have all the resources in the world to, be, to build everything they want in-house, they all realizing that be uh, focused on what you're actually doing and not spending time and resources uh, on not kind of primary for the business activities is the way to be more competitive. And the question there is how you can identify what are the key activities that are important for your business that create an intellectual property and value and what are the things that you should outsource, right? Mm. Uh, you know, we, we work with many big enterprise companies who were building a lot of their technology stack in house uh, and they spent millions of dollars just to discover after three or five years that, you know, it doesn't make any sense because we cannot catch up with the market. Mm -hmm. Even by having 100 or 1000 developers dedicated to this problem, there are companies on the market who have thousands of developers and thousands of leaders who are able to make it on a market scale, not just, you know, learning not just from one business, but from thousands of businesses. And these type of solutions will be always better and future-proofed comparing to what you build in-house. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that is a very important challenge nowadays. It's never been easier to start building products and developing there. And it's always a temptation to build it in-house, especially seeing how many other tools on the market and how difficult it is to choose from. But I think uh, you know companies should specialize, and uh, it will help them to grow their profits, and it will help them to build better culture internally if they can clearly articulate what they're doing uh, instead of trying to build and do everything themselves.